This video is the sequel to Property Attributes Part 1. If you haven't watched that video yet, you should do so first. In the last video, we learned about property attributes and property drawers, and we made an attribute that lets you randomize the value of a float variable in the inspector. Today, we'll expand our knowledge of property drawers and learn about something called type, as we make an attribute that allows us to assign an interface in the inspector. If you aren't familiar with interfaces, it's still possible to follow along with the video, but I highly recommend you learn about them in any case, as they are super useful for creating more loosely coupled code. An interface is essentially a contract or template that classes can implement. When they do so, they are forced to include all members that are defined in the interface. Now I'm back in Unity, at exactly the same point as I left off at the end of the last video. Let's just make an interface called iWeapon and a class to implement it called Sword. I'll just turn iWeapon into an interface and leave it completely empty. And then I'll let Sword inherit from Mono Behavior and implement iWeapon. If I now go into our example script and make a public field of type iWeapon and one of type Sword, we will see that only the Sword displays in the inspector. The reason for this is that interfaces are not serializable. So let's go ahead and solve this. I'll make an attribute called force interface and a drawer for it. Let's again begin with the attribute. It must of course inherit from property attribute and then we also want to include the system namespace. This is because we want to define the type of interface we want to be used, so we need a variable for that. The type of the variable will be type, which is found in the system namespace. Now, type can be a bit hard to wrap your head around, but it's essentially a way for us to see and store what the type of something is. When we define a class, it's like an abstract template, and when we make objects out of it, they are concrete instances of the class, which can then be manipulated and stored in variables. You can think of type as a way for us to store the template itself in a variable. This isn't only for classes though, it can also hold the type of interfaces, structs, enums, etc. So anyway, we will take the interface type and assign it in the constructor of the attribute. Now, in our example script, we'll have one public variable of type object. This is because object is the base class for all classes in Unity, and it is serializable, meaning its value can be stored in a file, it can be shown in the inspector, and we can interact with it through a serialized property in our property drawer. Then, we'll assign the attribute to this. The argument that we pass will be the type of the interface, which is exactly what the type of keyword that you've seen used so often is for. It gets the type of something, in this case our interface, so that we then can store it. In the drawer, we now want to make sure that only objects that implement this interface can be assigned. First, we do the necessary basics. We include Unity Editor, we specify that this is the drawer for force interface attribute, we inherit from property drawer, and then we override on GUI. In here, we can begin by checking that we are using the attribute properly, which we do by checking if the property type is object reference. If not, we'll display an error label like we did before. Then, we'll get a reference to the attribute. And let's also just call begin and end property to get our prefab functionality. Now, to display our variable, we want to call editorGUI.ObjectField. This will make a field where we can drag objects into. It takes a position and a label. Then it needs to know which value to show, which of course just will be the current value of the variable. Next, we need to tell it what kind of objects to accept. And here, we can just tell it to only accept those of the type specified in the attribute. Finally, it needs to know if it should allow scene objects to be passed in. We'll return to this one later and just leave it at true for now. The object field method returns the object that was last dragged into it, so we can simply update our variable to be equal to that. With this in place, we can head into Unity. As you see, our weapon variable is displayed with an object field. Let's put a sword component onto the game object. We can drag and assign it to our variable without problems, but we can't assign the example component, of course, because it doesn't implement the required interface, so that's great. Also, if we had something else that implemented the interface, such as a scriptable object, we could also assign that. But let's say I make a new game object and put a sort component on that too. You might expect to be able to assign the sort component of that game object by just dragging in the game object. Unfortunately, that does not work. The reason for that is that the object field only sees that the game object that is pulled in doesn't implement the interface, and as such, it is rejected. 
If we want to assign it, we have to do it with two inspector windows where we lock one of them, which is a pain to have to do. So let's improve our drawer. Instead of just assigning the output of object field immediately, we'll store it in a variable. Let's also change the object field to let in anything of type object. Then, depending on what the object is, we'll do different things with it. First of all, we'll check if it's null. If it is, we'll simply set the value of our variable to null. If that is not the case, we should see if the object implements the interface. Type has a method called isAssignableFrom, which we can call on the interface type of our attribute. It takes one type as a parameter, which will be the type of our object. To get it, we need to call getType on the object. The reason we can't use the typeOf keyword is that typeOf is run when the program is compiled and getType is executed at runtime. To use the analogy from before, typeOf is used on a template because then we know what the type is when we compile, but getType is used on a concrete instance because we won't know exactly what it is before it is assigned a value. Remember that while we for sure know that it is object, we don't know which child of object it will be, so that's why we need to use getType. Okay, so with that out of the way, isAssignableFrom checks for a few different things and I'll leave a link in the description where you can read a bit more about it, but what's important to us is that if it is called on the type of an interface, it will check if the past object implements that interface. So we take this object and we use this method to check if it implements this interface. If it does, the method returns true and we can assign the object as the value of our variable. The third case is where we have been passed a game object. We can easily check for this with the is keyword. So if this is true, we want to extract the component of the game object that has the interface. I'll make a mono behavior variable called component to store it in. So first we need to cast object to game object. This can safely be done as we just made sure that it indeed is a game object. Then we can run get component on it, but we won't use the generic version of the method like we usually would because it doesn't work with types. Instead, we'll pass the type as the argument of the method. Now, this will return the first component on the game object that implements the interface we want. The problem, however, is that now that we use the non-generic version of the method, it returns a component which actually is a parent class of mono behavior and therefore it cannot implicitly be cast to mono behavior. But we know that we never will make classes that derive from component instead of mono behavior, and as such it is impossible that a component with this interface is not a mono behavior. Therefore we can safely cast it to mono behavior. Now if the result is not null, meaning that we've actually found a fitting component, we can assign that as the value of our variable. Now our object field will accept directly assigning anything that implements the interface, it will accept game objects with a suitable component and it will reject everything else. But it is still not perfect. Let's say we have a second game object with the example script on it, but weapon is set to null. On the first game object, weapon has a value. If I select both game objects, the inspector will show null as the value for both. And if I now only select one object, it will have changed its value to null. Similarly, if I give each variable a different value and then select them both, it will display one of them. When I select them individually again, they now both have this value. This is of course not the behavior we want, so let's see why it happens and what we can do about it. In the object field, it displays the current value of the variable and then outputs it to a new variable, which we then run through some checks. When we have selected a second game object, our serialized property will point to both of them, which means that it will show one of the values in the object field and then put that into our new variable. Then it will run through the checks and confirm that it indeed is a valid object, and then it will assign this as the value to both variables. There is a rather simple solution to this. Before drawing the object field, we call editorGUI.beginCheck. This will start looking for if the user interacts with the UI and changes something. Then, after we have drawn it, we call editorGUI.endChangeCheck, which will return true if a change was made. Only if that is the case will we do something with the value of the object field. Otherwise, we just won't do anything. Now when we go into Unity and try the same thing again, it won't display any value at all when we select multiple game objects with different values. And more importantly, it also won't automatically change the value of anything. Finally, let's take a look at the parameter of object field that we skipped earlier. 
It determines whether or not the object field will accept objects from the scene. This matters because game objects that are saved as a file, such as a prefab, are not allowed to have references to objects in a scene. If I go into a prefab and drag in something from the scene, you will see that the object field won't reject it because we've told it that objects from the scene are okay, but as soon as it is applied, it will be set back to null. What is worse is what happens if it already had a value assigned. Let's say it has a reference to its own sort component. If I attempt to drag in something from the scene, our drawer will accept it at first, but then Unity will realize that something is wrong and immediately set it to null, meaning we lose whatever we had before. If we instead pass false as the argument of the method, it won't accept anything from the scene at all, not even if it itself is in the scene. We need to know whether the game object that we're currently editing exists on a scene or in a file and then pass true or false depending on the case. The way we do this is by using a method found in editor utility called isPersistent. It takes an object as a parameter which has to be the game object that we're editing. Serialized property has a variable called serialized object. If you remember from the start of the video, a serialized object is how we interact with selected objects in Unity. So serialized property is what we use to interact with the variable itself, and this is how we interact with the game object that the variable is on. This in turn has a variable called target object, which is a direct reference to the selected object itself, which is exactly what we need. Finally, this method will return true if it is persistent, meaning it's a prefab, so we just need to reverse that. With that done, our attribute and drawer are done. When editing an object in the scene, it accepts other objects from the scene. When editing a prefab, it does not. Just to make sure everything works, we can delete this second game object and head into our example script. In the start method, let's just cast weapon, which is an object, to iWeapon and print the result. There is something assigned here, so let's just click play. And as we can see, it is cast without any problem. And that's this video done. Experiment and play around with the two examples we've made so far until you have a good understanding of how they work and why they are written like they are. Get a feel for what's possible with property drawers, then you'll have everything you need to go onwards and make your own attributes. The next video will be the last one about property attributes. We'll explore how they behave in a race and how we can work with them. Remember that you're welcome to come by our Discord server if you have any questions or if you want to leave feedback for us. You're of course also welcome to do so in the comments of the video. Otherwise, just have a glorious day.